Iruña Ocar, aquí está con grafito y buruzco lehen y modifica la neta. Eduard Harry, arqueólogo A, está en modo judicial. Y se han dicho arqueólogo A, gaur egun mundu mailan, y hay en el área de Zenden, Harris Matrix, Industria, Sistema de Sorsalia Adam. Bermuda C, Neguiten Daudan, Berta Co, Itas Museo Co, Susendaria y Sanic. Harris E, Eliseo Gilek, Eguida Co, Industria Talanari, Burus e Talanori, Auditat Seco, Auterari Burus y Seguimori. En este primer congreso que se va a celebrar para estudiar los grafitos encontrados en Iruña Oca, tendremos como ponente a Edward Harris, renombrado arqueólogo, creador del sistema de excavación Harris Matrix, el más utilizado en la actualidad. Edward es hoy día el director del Museo Marítimo de las Islas Bermudas y nos hablará acerca de los trabajos de excavación realizados por Eliseo Gil y la posibilidad de hacer su auditoría. This is the first congress in which Iruña Oca graffiti will be studied and discussed. Edward Harris will be the main speaker. He is world famous for having created a new archaeological excavation system, the Harris Matrix. This methodology is worldwide used nowadays. Harris is the director of the Maritime Museum at Bermuda Islands and he will talk about the veracity of the excavations conducted by Eliseo Hill's team. He will also contemplate the possibility of doing an audit. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here in the Basque Country. And uh, I have a text prepared, but in the essence of time, uh, I think that can be distributed later, and I won't read the entire thing. Um, I will bring you greetings from Bermuda and show you a bit of peace and calm, the view from my house uh, in Bermuda, to introduce the areas. Just as an aside, this is Bermuda, 35 kilometers by three, sometimes described as 60,000 alcoholics clinging <coughs> to a rock in the middle of the North Atlantic. It was my privilege to be born there, and, uh, but eventually to go away and uh, become an archaeologist, uh, which has been a wonderful life. Uh, I believe that archaeology is one of the most important sciences and discipline in the world and nothing else has taught us more about ourselves over the last 50 years than has come from archaeology. I'm going to just run briefly through a couple of slides um, so I can perhaps explain to you, to those of you who aren't necessarily aware of the Harris matrix and new methods. And I will preface it by saying that I have had the opportunity of reading one of the reports from Rurunya Alea. And I've also had the opportunity of looking at some of the original records. I would also say that few archaeologists' records um, would stand up to the apparent scrutiny which these records have been given, and most records would probably be found deficient in some form or another. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the business of stratigraphy or stratification is really a, a two-part process, always. It's a question of erosion and deposition or deliberate erosion and deposition. So that is the duality of stratification. One of the problems with 
archaeological work before the Harris matrix and its associated methods came into being is that one half of that equation to a very large degree was left out of the equation and that is the surfaces. So that there are some units of stratification, if you will, that have a deposit and an associated surface and there are other units which are very, very important ones which only have surfaces, they have no deposits. In the early years of, of archaeology, uh, particularly uh, after the Second World War, the paradigm for archaeology was the section drawing. That's what we were all about. If you said, what is it to be an archaeologist? They'd show you the section drawing. This was very much brought, in, certainly in Britain, to the fore by Sir Mortimer Wheeler and Dame Kathleen Kenyon. And it resulted in the development of ways of controlling the digging, such as the Wheeler box, and so on, which eventually gave way to open area excavation. And one of the things that Mortimer Wheeler insisted on was that the, the lines between the deposits should be recorded. And what he didn't say at the time, or wasn't obvious at the time, what he was saying was that there's a very important element of the stratification that we're leaving out, and that is these lines. But those lines are the surfaces of archaeological deposits. Um, so, in terms of a paradigm for archaeology, we can say that the paradigm up until the time of the Harris Matrix was one-dimensional, because a section, work. a section is simply the depth through the site. It's one dimension. A surface is two dimensions to give you an area. So that gives you three dimensions. And of course, as we know, archaeological sites are time capsules within the deposits, without the deposits and surface and so on, and that gives you your fourth dimension. So that wasn't represented until the Harris matrix, which takes all the stratigraphic data and turns it into a four-dimensional diagram that you can represent on a piece of paper. And the four dimensions, each one of these boxes, represents the full three dimensions of a deposit, its depth, its length, and its width, and its relationship in relative time. So this one is the earliest, that comes above it, this one is overlaid by that one, and this one here. These diagrams, we originally called them layer charts because we were always tied into what was most important or most done about archaeology, which was the digging. We were diggers, so we were digging. So it was called a layer chart. And it was only after about a year that we realized that these represented the stratigraphic sequence of a site, which the section cannot do, because you simply cannot have enough sections. One here is different from one here, is different from one here. And the sections basically ignore the surface information. So that is a stratigraphic sequence of that section. <coughs> All right. These diagrams are compiled very simply because all you're asking is a fundamental question of each deposit, which came first, this or the computer or the desk. Which came first? So you have an over and under relationship or no relationship. That's a, just a regulatory one, it's not necessary. 
So once you've answered that question, as you're excavating down, you can build your sequence on the site hut wall. And at the end of the dig, you should be able to roll it up off the curb. So that on an excavation, all your stratigraphic data, notes, sections, plans, whatever, not the signs, whatever, feeds into the stratigraphic sequence. And the stratigraphic sequence can be compiled without any reference whatsoever to any artifacts. You don't need them. The, when, when we hear reference, as we've heard today, to stratification being false or whatever, it would be one of the most difficult jobs that an archaeologist could do to falsify stratification. And the reason for that is that people don't go out to make stratification. They go out to live. So we make a building. In the process of making a building, we create stratification. So we go over here and get some material for roads to lay down road gravel. People don't make stratification. It's incidental to living. And because of that, it's an unbiased record of the past. And the stratification of the site controls these artifacts in their analysis. If you don't have the stratigraphic sequence, your analysis of your artifacts doesn't have a testing pattern against which they can be compared. And the problem, which of course we're talking about today, is that artifacts are unreliable. An artifact can be moved without losing its integrity. Whereas stratification can't be moved without destroying it, which of course is what we do as archaeologists. So artifacts are unreliable, and we have to lock them in through the analysis of this sequence in relationship to the, to the artifacts. So, your stratigraphic sequence is bringing everything together all the time. And normally, if this was a small excavation, you would look at each of these sections as one entity. But they're actually, uh, as a single entity, each four of them. But they're actually one unit. And the only way you can represent them is to combine them in your stratigraphic sequence. So this is the sequence of this one here. That's the sequence of that one. When you put them all together, that's the sequence of that single uh, diagram. If you add in your plan information, a little composite plan, that's the sequence of it, so on, that feeds into that, feeds into that, feeds into that, and then you analyze your finds and start to periodize your records. So every, every archaeological site has its own unique stratigraphic sequence. If, if you will, if you're, you're more uh, chemically inclined, every archaeological site has its own DNA, its model. So here's a group of sites all dumped on the same Iron Age ditch, and they all look different because each site is different. Okay, that's okay. Okay, thank you. The right and the left. Thank you. These these ones are a bit stunted because they were excavated before the matrix. And part of the matrix is understanding that surfaces are absolutely critical to getting a decent stratigraphic sequence. And, but anyway, each archaeological site has its own 
unique stratigraphic sequence, and that is its value to history and to archaeology. If every site had the same sequence, there's no point in digging anything. It all be the same. Ah. So, this was the first site in 1974, the first site in the world, we would contend, that had a stratigraphic sequence. This is actually the Roman the gate, the south gate into the Roman town of Winchester of several periods. Which one's the point of the button? Oh, okay. So that was a Roman, that was the wooden wooden gate going into the city, later taken away, and a stone gate into the city, the, the city wall going through here, the gate actually across there coming back, and the, the city wall going through there. And then in the Anglo-Saxon period, the gate was actually blocked off um, with a ditch going across and so on. So this was the first archaeological site to have what we now know is a true stratigraphic sequence. But even this one is probably about 40% or more undervalued because we didn't record all of the surfaces, particularly um, some of the surfaces which are only surfaces in on themselves. And you can see that the the stratigraphic sequence, just in a drawing, starts to give you a sense of the development of the site. So here, this is another site. This is the first site I worked on uh, after the matrix. Uh, I was given 70 site notebooks, 200 plans and sections, <coughs> and told to sort it out. Now what we know that now means is to make the stratigraphic sequence of the site, which you can do on the site now instead of after the fact. Um, and so in that diagram there's about 10,000 units, <coughs> many of which are unstratified in the records because they didn't record in a correct sort of way, so there might be a unit here and there's nothing underneath of it because it, the record wasn't made. But you can see how the, the sequence itself starts to tell you about the development of the site. So this is the Roman period, a bit of activity. Saxon period, even less activity. And then in the post-medieval period, there are five or six houses built on the site with alleyways in between. So you get this major explosion of your, of your site. And then just come back to, to this, what um, Morton Mawil was saying, when people drew sections like this, which they called naturalistic, they weren't doing their job fully. It should like, look like this, with the lines in between the deposits. Well, those lines between the deposits um, are, of course, the surfaces of the deposits or the surface of a unit that doesn't have a deposit. And if you excavate unstratigraphically, if you excavate at arbitrary levels, which some people still do, you destroy the surfaces before you have the chance of recording them, and you also, of course, mix the artifacts up. So if you excavate in arbitrary levels, you simply don't have the opportunity to record the surface. And that's the main objection to any type of arbitrary excavation, be it by machine or whatever, is that you destroy the surfaces before you can record them. So when we realized that the surfaces were vital to stratigraphic interpretation, we did an experiment in 1975, and on this ditch site, of which I showed you the section earlier, we had the archaeologists record every surface as they went down. And this is simple to do because all you want is the boundary of the deposit with a couple of spot heights on it. So they did all that. The point is that you can then overlay these 
one on top of the other. You can literally stack them all up, which now you can do in GIS systems, no problem, and you can build up the site um, as you go along. And one of the uh, points about all of this, if, if, you ask, if you ask us as professionals, what, are, what is one of the major goals of an archaeological excavation? And the answer has to be, aside from making the stratigraphic sequence, which is crucial, is that you are able to reconstruct the site after you've excavated it. And the reconstruction of the site is entirely dependent on the recording of surfaces. If you don't record the surfaces, you cannot put the site back together again. So that we can say categorically that most excavations worldwide before the 1970s, it will be reasonably impossible to reconstruct those sites because in those days we only recorded surfaces that we thought were important, like a absolute clear floor, a tessellated floor, something like that. Um, and we are also recording <coughs> floors in composite plans, so we are putting together the period or the surface of a plan, the composite surface of a plan, before we analyze the artifacts. And the problem with composite plans is that you have a lot of data loss. So if I make a composite plan of this desk, and that's all I do, and we get back into the lab, and I take this away, there's a hole underneath of it, a data hole. There's no information underneath of it. So you, you're, you're locked into the plan that you did during the excavation, which is in many instances not the plan of a particular period of the site. It's the plan of your period of excavation. The problem with sections, and there are only sections to um, say this is what the sequence of the site was, is you can, how do you get from here to there to there over to here? How do you relate all of that? And that's what the matrix does. Sections are useful to have, but if you record every surface on the site and put it into a GIS system, as you well know, particularly people younger than me who can work these programs, you can make a section through the site by the computer wherever you want it because you've recorded all of your surfaces and you have spot out to spot height on them. So, as I said, I think we can distribute this later. Um, the, um, the matrix came into Spain. Um, uh, friends of mine and students from Barcelona uh, wrote me one day. And, and uh, their main purpose of writing was to find out whether I was still alive. The question was, are you dead? And uh, they wrote back, no, I was still alive, and actually I was quite young, but obviously I must have been quite old to have done anything um, like change the paradigm of archaeology. Anyway, they had recorded when the book came into Spain, the, the, the person who brought in the train and so forth. So it, it's been in Spain for uh, since the late 1980s and it has been used by the archaeologists in question and one of the things they've done is to elaborate uh, properly reflecting what's going on on the site. So when most archaeological reports periodize the site, or let's say earlier ones, all you read about is what was found in the deposits. You seldom get a period that talks about the surfaces upon which people live. You can see their diagram here is beginning to reflect the fact, going back to our original diagram on stratification, surfaces and deposits, surfaces and deposits. And when you periodize your stratigraphic sequence, you have periods of deposition and periods of use. And here you see their periods of use uh, coming in, which represent 
the period in which the deposit was made was in use. And one of the most important things about this, and it came up early on in geology in 1795, when Thomas Hutton in Scotland pointed out to archaeologists that the surfaces occupied immeasurably more time than the deposits. And this is particularly true in archaeology. So if we were laying down a concrete floor, it would take a day or half a day, the big machines out there pouring down the concrete, and that's our deposit, and it's full of ceramics with graffiti on them, and this concrete deposit. But the surface may be in use for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And in historic towns like you have here, you have surfaces of deposits which are still in use after hundreds of years. So surfaces are critical to the whole business of, of um, archaeology and in the interpretation of stratigraphy. So, this was a advertisement for an iPad, some of you may have seen, for Pompeii, and uh, there you have the a matrix on an iPad. One of my colleagues from Canada now does all of the recording on their excavations with iPads. Uh, every student or digger has an iPad. All of the information goes right onto the iPad. They have programs to build their uh, diagrams and so on. So the paper I wrote, ladies and gentlemen, is something you can read um, on, your, on your own. My purpose here today is, is to say that um, I have looked, uh, let's put this the other way around. Um, in accounting, as you all know, and we all don't like to know, you have to call in the auditors to see if your books are correct. And they use the standard of double entry bookkeeping to ascertain whether your books are correct or whether you've been fudging the records or whatever. With the Harris Matrix and its associated com uh, concepts, principles of archaeological stratigraphy, anyone who understands those can go anywhere in the world and audit an archaeological site or the records of it because stratification is everywhere the same. I don't need to know <clears throat> what, whether Eruna is a Roman town, or medieval town, or whatever. I don't need to know that in order to audit the records and tell you exactly whether people are doing their job correctly or not. Because the principles of stratigraphy are related to surfaces and deposits. And it's not totally relevant in the first part of the audit to know what the cultural content is. In the same way that you do not need to know what the artifacts are when making a stratigraphic sequence. So it has given us the ability to audit and revisit, uh, and which in a sense is what an audit is, and revisit excavations that have been done in the past and, and try and understand if they haven't been a stratigraphic sequence wasn't made, whether it's possible to make one or not. Um, and also to see whether the archaeologists are doing their job correctly. This is now being legislated. So in <coughs> Flanders, for example, uh, last year, the government has legislated that if you get money to excavate from the government, you have to use the principles of archaeological stratigraphy as we sort of laid out generally today. So, um, in terms of the excavations under question, uh, this bit of confusion, uh, confusing two matters. One is the excavation and its recording, and the second is what to do about these artifacts. And as we said, these artifacts are unreliable. I can't analyze the artifacts as our learned gentleman did earlier. I don't know anything about early Basque language 
or Latin or whatever, or how things were spelled or whatever, civil and so on. Um, in looking at the records, without doing a complete and full audit, which means I have to go through everything, see if my making up of a stratigraphic sheet from their records agree with uh, what they've shown. But it does appear to me that the excavators at Aruna have carried out their work using the best practice um, of modern times, as it were, and that if I was called upon to do so, I have full confidence that if I did an a full audit of their records, I would be able to say that stratigraphically, they excavated correctly, and they recorded stratigraphically correctly, and therefore, because stratification is undesignedly commemorative of the past, that their stratigraphic record and their stratigraphic sequence is true. And beyond that, if they say that this group of artifacts came from that deposit and that point in the sequence, one has to accept that. And then you have to analyze the artifacts, but not just those artifacts, but the artifacts and the deposits above them, the artifacts and the deposits below them, to see if there's consistency through the stratigraphic column in terms of chronology and what have you. So, I'll, I'll finish shortly. Yeah, thank you. Um, anyway, um, I, have, I was given the opportunity of going to have a look at the site yesterday. It's a, it's a marvelous site, obviously worked there for a hundred years for archaeologists to do. It's out in the green field, so it's not under threat. And um, it seems to me that the, there are two resolutions for the particular matter at hand, which I have to say is most unusual. I don't think I've ever heard of such a situation before. And I would challenge people who commented on the stratigraphy and the stratigraphic records of the site, I would challenge them to let me have a look at them and compare. I would like to see how they came to their conclusions by auditing the stratigraphy. Um, but it's a, it's a marvelous site. And uh, ultimately, in the fullness of time, uh, if one is to continue this controversy about the artifacts, um, let's assume they're true uh, and they're not fakes, um, but the only test in the fullness of time to see whether this corpus of material is real is to do some more excavation and to see whether you recover more things and more attention will be paid to detail. So if I was the archaeologist, I have my webcam, and everything that was the moment it was found, the webcam would be on it, so there'd be no question that that was put in there later, that it came from there and so on. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention, um, and we'll, you can have the paper to read later at your leisure, but just to give you a sense of, of um, the fact that it's now possible, in my view, particularly with GIS and GPS and laser scanners and 3D laser scanners, for us to capture the surfaces of, of in excavations, and they are absolutely critical to compiling your stratigraphic sequences because you can do it on deposits alone because there are some surfaces that stratigraphic units are prime deposits, um, and uh, hopefully more excavations will take place at Verona Vallela and, and uh, uh, more of these wonderful artifacts and many other things besides will be found, including terrific stratigraphic sequences and everything associated with them uh, at your wonderful site. Thank you.
Sí, yo quería preguntarle al doctor Harvey si uh, la, el análisis est estratigráfico es suficiente para la adaptación. Si, uh, si es suficiente, basta el análisis estratigráfico. Pues si en el caso de Irunia de Leria, ¿cree que es necesario hacer algún otro tipo de análisis arqueométrico sobre las piezas? To what? No, I, can I say in English? Or? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, my question is whether uh, you think that stratigraphy is sufficient to, for dating the objects in Urania Valenia, or if, if you think that in, the, in, in this case it would be necessary to do some uh, archaeometric tests on the objects. The purpose of stratification is to set the testing pattern. That testing pattern will assist you when you take the artifacts. But take a good example, say a piece of timber, and you're going to radiocarbon date it, or you're going to dendrochronology it. And then you go back to your testing pattern to see how the date you get for radiocarbon or dendrochronology fits in terms of the position where you find it in the stratigraphic sequence. And it may well be, just in terms of chronology, that the dating of that piece of timber is totally irrelevant, it's totally out of sequence, it's, it's uh, residual, so it came in much later or whatever. So, so the point is that, of course, you're going, to, you're going to test your artifacts not only for chronology, but you're going to test them for all sorts of other authenticity. Is this really a Roman pot or is whatever? You can test it in all sorts of different ways, but then you have to come back in terms of chronology and get it back into the information into the sequence, and then you may be lucky if say you've got coins throughout your sequence, but you have to then determine whether they're in their real position or whether they're useless in terms of chronology because they're residual artifacts. So of course you're going to test the artifacts and then You, you, do, you can do that independently with all sorts of tests, but when you come back to draw, doing your report, you have to take that information back into the testing pattern, see if it's consistent through the column, because what's normally done is that people just look at one deposit, and they forget that the evidence of that deposit chronologically may be altered by what's above it and what's above that. And But anyway, at the end of the day, when you come to make up your reconstruction of your site, your different periods and surfaces, it's the artifacts that help to push or lower the surfaces so you can get the surfaces into their right time band. So, yes, absolutely, but it, it becomes a, a back and forth uh, process. Yes. 